invite people that maybe if you don't feel comfortable asking in English, right in the chat. I will be focused on the chat if you need any questions. Um, if you have any questions, and Cody, who is the co-host of this event from Pittsburgh Ethereum, is going to be uh, taking, and he's going to be focused on who raises uh, their hands. Because here, as you can see, I'm raising and lowering my hand. So this is a way I just like to ask for for the word to, for the right to, to speak. So let, let's waste three, let's wait five minutes, but if anyone knew, I mean, we already know, we already know between Goose, Johnny, Cody, Red, but if someone wants to present him or herself, you are more than welcome to open your mics, your cameras, because this is going to be more like a conversation. Okay, thank you. Cool. Like, th this is the hard part for the hosts in order for make people to to talk. So we're going What's to that? do some, some experiment. <laughs> so I'm going to introduce myself. I'm going to, yeah, we used to play this, I wait to just like a quick induction, like no more than a minute. So to answer three three questions, what's your name? Uh, what are your interests and where are you connecting from? Well, these two are like, what's your name? Where are you from? What are your interests? And if you see the screen, you can then you throw the, the word to anyone else. So I will start. So this is Juan I'm from Bogota. Right now I'm living in Bogota. I'm from Colombia. I am the host of E3 in Bogota. Um, so as you can understand and, and suppose I'm really into Ethereum, I'm really glad to create this community and to learn more about blockchain. Uh, this is our third meetup. So we're excited to use the platform that we are also developing with Emilio, which is not yet here, that is Coinosis. And I will then send the word to Cody, since we're the host, we have to introduce ourselves. Sure. Hello, everybody. Uh I'm Cody. I'm uh, the organizer for Pittsburgh Ethereum. Uh, like Juan, I am super interested and passionate about Ethereum. I think it's great. I think the community that exists is really awesome and you know they super helpful. So I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm happy to learn from the speakers and I'm happy to meet all of you and thank you all for coming. And I'm going to pass it to, is Jessica here? Yeah, I'm gonna pass it to Jessica. No, but I don't see Jessica. Do you see her on the... I don't see her yet. So is that Goose? Do I see Goose here? Yep, that's Goose. Yeah, yeah so I'm... So I'm here. Uh, hello, Cody. Uh, nice to see you. Hello, yeah, everyone. Nice to see you, too. Um, yeah, well, I guess I'm going to introduce myself. I'm, I'm, my name is Gus. I'm, I'm based here in Mexico City. I'm originally from here. Um, I'm a Bitcoin enthusiast for, for a while now. I'm, uh, I'm, a, I'm an engineer and also a, an artist. And uh, I've been invo getting involved more and more in the NFT world from the very beginning, from, from the dark uh, ages of, of crypto collectibles in 2016 and I've been watching this ecosystem grow and uh, and all the predictions have been fulfilled and I'm very excited to see this uh, growing more and more and I have a lot of interesting uh, data and, and things to share with you guys so thanks for having me. Yeah, nice to see you here too. So yeah, I'm gonna introduce myself. Uh, I go by Red. Um, I'm an artist, art blogger. Uh, I I art blog more than I, I would say I art blog more than I uh, work. Use I would say, which I should improve on. But blogging and networking is main is currently a a main for me. Um, yeah.
So or, who, you, or who has questions or who else is on? You can or, send the or, word where anyone, like maybe not the speaker, so we can get to know more people. Someone that you see on the screen, you can hover. Oh, John, um, Johnny. Yes. Well, let's, let's get to know who, you, yeah, let's get to know who you are. All right, uh, okay, well, I'm Johnny Dollar. I am a, a painter, illustrator. Um, I've been in the crypto space since late 2012. Um, yeah, no, I've, uh, I came in it from a crypto anarchist point of view. Um, inspired by those guys, it really kind of, I've been leading down a path of technology for a while and um, crypto just sort of is a part of that tool of the uh, liberty-minded person that I am. Uh, yeah, no, and uh, that's me. Any other? And I'm glad to be here. I don't know if I was the one, only one having some issues with your audio. Maybe, I don't know what's like going on and off. Hi, everybody. Okay. Hello. Hey, hey Mohara, oh, Jessica. Jessica's, here. Jessica's here now. Yeah. yeah. How's everybody doing today? Fine. <laughs> Fine. Okay, great. We're good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're having, we're just like getting to know each other. Uh, mm -hmm. Please, yeah, guys, remember to mute yourself while you're not talking so we don't have feedback. So yeah, we're just like spend the first minutes just like doing some intro. So Jessica, I mean, yes, sure. Could you um, yourself, like? <laughs> I'm happy to do that. Hi everybody, thanks for being here. Hi my fellow artist friends, Johnny Goose, everyone here. Um, yeah, so I'm a visual artist. I make installation artwork on interior spaces and sometimes outdoors, but like they take over walls and ceilings. It's like kind of uh, site specific installations that I'm making and they're inspired by the world of information as if you could dive in and see, uh, go sightseeing kind of in this Tron-like world. Um, I like to bring these experiences to people to kind of talk a little bit about how our world right now is so influenced by uh, information in the digital space. So that is the re reason why I entered the blockchain space because these installations have such heavily uh, aesthetics that speak to, to being in that space. So um, in 2017, I was approached by a blockchain project that wanted me to do this installation representing the connection between two blockchains. And uh, that also had to do with building a community around uh, the art and blockchain space, because these installations that I make are also work as sort of spaces for other people to interact inside of. I create public programs, invite people to take over with videos, or uh, I, I host a panel discussion inside, or invite a musician to play something uh, in a way to connect the community of where the installation is to connect with those people and also to you know gain more visibility and more, more exposure and then we all win you know uh so because of this um uh this project called truebit said okay well we like what you're doing with community we would and like to invite you to sort of make that connection like figure out who's in the blockchain space and the art space i started the telegram group and that's how i basically know all of the people here today um so yeah it seems like back then i didn't really know where this was going and now i'm just in awe to see how much um uh, momentum's gained how much energy is around it and it seems like i'm i'm, I'm here to stay <laughs> Well, that's awesome. As you mentioned, share the link for that awesome group that you have in Spanish oh, yeah. and in English. It's a great way to connect among developers and artists. So yeah, I would like to invite someone else to someone from the audience because I mean, we already know each other. 
Ajá. to maybe say hello. Si se siente más cómodo en español, adelante en la presentación. Creo que Johnny puede entender un poco. Red y Cody quedarán un poco atrás, pero igual. Hey, I veo a Baron. Así que si alguien quiere entrar en español o en English, this is experiment, so we are trying to figure out how this works. Yes, I'm happy to begin the experiment with you. Great. So I'm going to say hello around here. So hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Natalia Madrid. I'm part of the Ethereum Foundation. I'm DEFCON production lead. Uh, so happy about being here and getting to know more about art and crypto and probably getting some ideas to DEFCON. Uh -huh. Wow, that's amazing. I was thinking about that, that that's just such a great topic to have that on, on DEFCON in Bogota. So, well, we have a good way to kickstart stuff. So anyone else who wants to say hello, to introduce him or herself? Hey, Baron, go ahead. Ah, uh, your mic is not working. Your yeah, mic we see. Yeah. There is a there is a, an arrow, so you can choose the microphones. There is you have different options. So maybe whose dog is that? I hear a dog. Who has a dog? Johnny has a dog. <laughs> I saw. I, I do have a dog, but. Uh... He's uh, he hasn't made a noise in uh, months. He's deaf and very old. Um, but yeah, here's my dog. Yeah, what breed is he? That's a Jack Russell. Cute dog. He's a good dog. Well, Baron. Uh, well, what's the shame? So, if anyone else, if we don't have any more volunteers, we can start. I'm going to share. Actually, I think we have one more. Uh, Alan just joined us. Uh, Alan is part of uh, my awesome. meetup in Pittsburgh. Go ahead. He actually gave a talk the last time we met up. So Alan, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself real quick, just tell us a little bit about yourself. That'd be great. I didn't even get a chance to really even know what's going on. Um, sorry. Uh, yeah, I just, I'm really into the crypto space, uh, especially anything that you can build on, whether that be um, Ethereum, Cardano, just anything with smart contracts and tokens, because I feel like that's how this stuff is really going to change the game. And I saw this and was really interested because I think NFTs and everything going on, whether it's art or any sort of conceptual digital asset is really going to change the way people, it lets people experience crypto, which is, I think is a missing gap. So have a software architecture engineering background. That's a quick rundown on me. Awesome, thank you. Uh, yeah, you can go ahead and kick it off, Juan. Yeah, I was just like getting ready. This is our agenda, some topics that we would like to cover. Um, Cody and I will be guiding the conversation we have some introductory questions for you guys, so feel free, the speakers, to uh, yeah, to answer them. But first, as we discuss, if you, I mean, Jessica did a bit of more of, of an, a, a longer introduction, which was amazing. But we would like to know more about maybe Gus. What's your work? So more about what are you into? So people can know can know what type of topics are you expert. Okay. Sure. Uh, well, I've been uh, helping develop uh, a couple of, of softwares uh, related to art marketplaces, art marketplaces on the blockchain. I first started a couple of years ago with a project called Artolin, which I already uh, talk about in, in greater length in another episode of Co Cognosis. 
And this basically we create uh, NFTs on the Bitcoin blockchain through a smart contract called Counterparty. And um, from there, I, I just recently start playing more and more with Ethereum. And uh, precisely this year, uh, thanks to Johnny Dollar here, I, I, me and my team of devs, we developed uh, uh, an idea that Johnny Dollar uh, started uh, some time ago called Artist Liberation Front. So we optimize that smart contract so we can do NFTs on, on Ethereum as well. And these are all open source uh, platforms for anyone to mint their own art tokens uh, instead of having to go through a process of, of selection with a, with, a, with a platform like Super Rare or, 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 or the big ones that we all know. So basically we are, we are putting out software for anyone to mint their own NFTs and try to monetize them on the market in a in an in an open way awesome uh, i will let cody to guide this part so i'm going to be focused on chat so for you to leave the more like the voice part sure um if you want to move your meta mask there for a second juan Perfect, thank you. All right, you so, so the first uh, topic that we were uh, going to discuss today was art marketplaces on the blockchain. And as uh, Gus was saying, that's but, kind but of his Cody, Yeah. What if we let also Johnny to talk more about his work? I mean, just like an introduction, like more in depth. Sure, so, that's uh, fine. Johnny, Red and, and Jessica maybe uh, for the newcomers. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay, for no sure. Problem. So uh, I'll uh, guess. Uh, okay, go ahead, Red. Oh, sorry. Um, okay, so, so yeah, uh, I'm an artist, art blogger. Um, getting artists educated about blockchain is really what I like to do, especially getting new people. Um, regard and also uh, regardless of what blockchain network they end up liking at the end because i feel like sometimes um these networks could be tribal and stay in their network and not branch out so i try to do more of that uh, on other platforms um just uh, ed educate educating by just leaving information out and um artists are open-minded to new concepts a lot more so that's why I uh, like talking to artists about this kind of technology because um, they may not be the most technical people, but at least they're open-minded, right? Um, yeah, that's, that's basically uh, what I do on the art blogging side, but my art side, uh, I uh, have a digital photography background so I experiment with uh, QR codes because, uh, well, it, it's a long story, but I'll, this is just an introduction. I'll, I'll hold off to I'll hold on to that for the last part. But um, yeah, I would say my main influence is uh, digital digital photography, and um, this might sound weird, but the uh, uh, Amazon and eBay app scanning uh, app. If anybody knows what that is or if anybody's used any of those kind of apps where you scan uh, barcodes or uh, or images, you, you could scan an image and uh, it'll show up on online or on the internet or Google will find out, I'm not sure, but um, yeah. Awesome, thank you, Red. Uh, Jessica, if you wanna give us a little more information and that would be great. Yeah, I mean, I can share that I'm excited to be here using Coinoise's uh, platform. And I believe art has the power to bring together different technologies and be the sort of um, space for experimentation. And that's the reason why I'm really interested in uh, the blockchain and art space 
uh, merging together because you can play with yes nfts are really interesting but there are other things that you can play with you can play with data visualizations you can use uh blockchain data to sort of interact with you know the physical space as well through hardware integrations um and yeah i'm excited about this merging between art and blockchain because of the potential that art has to bring the space to the public eye in a way that is more experiential uh, rather than technical, which is the way that we're used to sort of approaching the su subject, the blockchain subject. And it seems to be really hard for people to just grasp the magnitude of it, uh, the implications, the social implications that it has. Um, so um, beyond just using blockchain as a tool for artists to monetize, I'm mostly interested in using art to make blockchain more accessible to a wider audience. Uh, so I'm right now working on a project with the Vancouver Biennial of Public Art to think about uh, public space, because this is a biennial for in, in the public space for public art, and think about uh, the blockchain space as this sort of public space, because it is uh, a space that is open, it is, um, you know, open source based, it is uh, transparent, it is completely uh, visible for us to see. So I like to think of the blockchain space as this sort of public space as well. So I'm working with the Biennale to sort of bring this new branch, the new arm of their practices that are that tend to be more modern in the sense that more traditional and, you know, they would just think of public art as the sculpture in the park. But uh, we can think of uh, art in the digital space as public art as well. So that's something I'm working on right now. And um, I know that a lot of the conversation around art and blockchain is mostly focused on NFTs and these platforms that allow for digital scarcity, which is something that I guess we'll be talking about. Uh, but I feel like I bring to this conversation uh, this other sort of different point of view that has to do with uh, the other sort of use cases of blockchain and art, as I mentioned, through experiments, um, and to use blockchain as a sort of catalyst to to bring the blockchain space to to be sort of seen in a in a way that it's more approachable. Awesome! Thank you so much. And uh, Johnny, if you want to go ahead and kind of give a little bit of a uh, overview of your work and how it kind of ties into this conversation, that would be great as well. Okay, cool. Um, can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay. Um, well, like I said, uh, you know, I, uh, Gus, Jessica, all like me, you know, we're visual artists and we've come into this space uh, doing different things. Um, I am a painter, so I came into it from, like I said, a crypto anarchist point of view. Like for me, blockchain was a way to, uh, like a tool to fight tyranny for liberty. And I was really mostly interested in the cryptography part of the thing. Um, so I'll just show a couple pieces and you'll kind of get an idea what I mean. Like I said, I, I came at it from the angle of physical art, cryptography, and let me share a couple application windows. Um, all right. If you can you see this one, this painting uh, is called "Show Me Your Cookies," uh, and it's uh, inspired by an academic paper called "Show Me Your Cookies," and I'll tell you who you are. And in the paper, the guys had uh, written they were it was an old paper. They were looking at browser cookies, and we all know this now. But back then, they you know revealed that from browser cookies, they could tell a person's age, race, gender, but they could also tell you know where they lived, where they went to school, and what they were going to do in the future. Um, so I really got inspired by that. That was show me your cookies and the cookie monster just consuming data. Uh, and this woman, she's walking naked through a digital landscape, unaware that she's being tracked by these birds. And the birds kind of form the cookie monster. And on a practical level, all those QR codes are scannable. And they lead to a different place online. It tells like a loose narrative depending on where you start and where you end. But there's also a, a, an Ethereum wallet within there that uh, holds the NFT of the token of this painting. 
uh, and there's a private key hidden and it's it's been solved. The private key is the circular uh, cookie, which is medieval cryptography. Um, you know, you put a round, like a mirrored cylinder in the middle of that, if that painting was laid flat and the reflection would be a square. Uh, it's something they were doing in the middle ages, really old school cryptography. Um, let's see, let me show you. All right, am I back on screen? Okay. Um, any questions about that one or? It was, okay. that is awesome. I just have to say that's so cool. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll just show oh, go ahead. My favorite Sesame Street character, by the way. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> um, feel free to try scanning those QR codes. Um, you will, there's, there's good information in there. I'll show one more. It's just, um, this one was, I showed at the Rare AF uh, too. It was a art festival. And uh, this one is called Cornan, and it's, you know, I could go into the details of what it's inspired it, but, you know, that's another conversation. It's about AI and uh, fighting back. But within this painting is a, uh, a hardware wallet. Uh, I have, uh, in that painting, I attached a hardware wallet, and I'll show you a better photo and make it doop. And it's here. All right. So if you can see that is in the painting, there's a little hardware wallet that not only holds crypto, but uh, holds like a counterparty token. Thanks, Gus. He was one of the guys that taught me about uh, counterparty and that's on the Bitcoin blockchain. So that holds uh, that painting holds uh, crypto as well as some data and information. And one of the things I did with it is I've spoken at some anarchist conference and I showed people how to, uh, uh, it was called how to hide millions in art, you know, and it was ways to store your private keys and creative ways to store your private keys. Um, yeah, I kind of come at it from that angle. I'm, I guess I'm less community minded. I'm more uh, criminally minded, um, but you know, we all have to be true to ourselves. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's me. Uh, and uh, I'll take any questions or comments or dirty looks or whatever you want to do. No, no, I think the QR code is it's it's a it's because I I could relate to that too. Um, the, the funny thing about QR codes is they they could they they're open source. It's it's an open source utility, and it's it's almost like the same thing as blockchain. It's open source. Yes, yes, it everyone is. Everyone could use it, and it's you could generate. And in in your in my in from my position, it's almost as if okay, so I can't code anything at all, and these QR codes are the only thing that I could generate, and I'm able to kind of fit into this space of um, people who have. Uh, coding backgrounds or web developing backgrounds. Okay. Well, QR codes are just a way to share information. I mean, like it's a way a computer will read the information. Um, it's almost like an alphabet. It's just a way of presenting data. As time goes on, um, you'll be able to do the same thing with a photo or any, any type of thing, sounds, uh, that'll just call information somewhere else like a qr code is like a bookmark it's just kind of like an address to other information but it could be text it could be all kinds of stuff but yeah i mean the the future is exciting you know like i to me that's the most exciting part about a part about all this is making new and more interesting art and that's happening like really i'm more excited about the blockchain art space in the last six months that i've been in like a year and a half just all the new creative like ideas that are coming out that are actually like allowing new types of artwork and funding it, you know, it, it's, it's great. It's really great. Uh, I'd like to add to that if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, what you're saying, uh, new, new ways of, you know, creating art and funding it, that's something that 
um, with the uh, kind of DAO structures and the sort of treasuries that some of these blockchains hold, it is also easy for us artists to uh, access some funds that we sometimes are not aware are out there. Um, you know, it kind of mirrors a little bit of the process of writing a grant, let's say. Uh, but, you know, it, there is there are resources out there. Most of the way that I have been able to, you know, work in this space has not been by tokenized art because I don't have tokenized art yet. I'm still in the exploration of how to make tokenization work for my work, which is installation work. It's not digital art. So that's like a whole new sort of realm to explore in what ways you can sort of um, make of the concept of an installation something that could be, you know, purchasable through a token or by dividing the design into layers or whatever options that are starting to appear in the space. Uh, but there are a lot of ways for us artists to reach out to these uh, different blockchains and there are treasuries. I did one project for Dash in 2017 and it was through working through the Dash treasury. So uh, there certainly are resources in the space. And um, I like the fact that you have the option as an artist to access these funds and sort of not have to follow this, uh, um, I would say like paternalistic view of the art world as we know it, that you need a gallery to, um, you know, uh, give you the, the green light or accept your art, then you have to go through all these like boot leaking processes basically to get to a gallery, you know? Um, yeah, and I think for us artists, there's a lot of space to, to access resources in the blockchain space that um, maybe we should look at that a little more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I can add something to that because I think it's entirely true. Uh, regarding the NFTs uh, and the tokenization of art, that's very interesting. And I would like to go back to that. But uh, what Jessica said is very important because there are so many opportunities for people to get involved in different projects. Like I was never the kind of person that uh, is very good at, at getting grants or applying for, for scholarships and all. I did what I, what I needed to do while, while I was in my, uh, doing my studies as an engineer, but then in the in the cultural world, it was always for me like a burden to go through all those processes because they are like troublesome and uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, but then here in the in the in the blockchain ecosystem is it, is awesome. There are so many opportunities. As Jessica said, like I was invited to Venezuela in 2017 with a Dash project as well. And then I've been sponsored by the guys of Decrete in some of the Bitcoin meetups that we have organized here in Mexico City. So there are a lot of a lot of ways now in the in the Ethereum uh, ecosystem. There are so many uh, projects trying to find ways of funding uh, their 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 people, like uh, DeFi and all these projects that are very uh, very getting very popular now. So that's that's very very interesting and very important to 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 uh, to point to. And later maybe I I can talk a little bit more about the NFTs because that's super exciting. That's uh, we are very 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 happy with what's happening because we are seeing this 2020 a big uh, move forward into the direction that we were all waiting for for the past few years. Awesome, thank you. Um, Juan, is there a specific direction in which you wanted the conversation to move? Uh, as we discussed earlier, we can go through the, the topics that we have been, yeah, think about for this, this panel. So now that we're talking about like marketplaces, I would like to, yeah, to go through that rabbit hole. Um, you have this great idea about accessibility, Cody. What, what's your approach on that? Yeah, sure. So um, <clears throat> I am sorry. Um, you know, I actually, uh, I'm not much of an artist. I would call myself more of a doodler, um, kind of like Keith Haring inspired, I guess. But that when in my free time, that's more of the work that I do. So learning about um, 
crypto art has been really fascinating and I kind of wish I had discovered it sooner. Uh, so my question is in terms of, and Jessica kind of hit on this a little bit, but in terms of accessibility, um, do you see uh, crypto art and art on the blockchain as a means of accessibility for the general public? Um, whoever wants to answer first can go ahead and jump in. And if uh, I know you kind of touched on Jessica, not necessarily making, um, I can't remember how you phrased it as in making the blockchain more accessible or making art more accessible via the blockchain. But I liked how you said what you said. Yeah, I can expand a little bit on that. Um, I think it just goes both ways. And that's the beauty of this relationship that it's it's bringing value to both the blockchain space and the art space. Um, if you think of uh, how the blockchain space may be uh, a tool for more accessibility to the blockchain space, it is in the sense that um, we have, you know, five senses and that's, kind of how we perceive the world in in our immediate you know first impression obviously we can expand on more complex structures that are more conceptual uh, but when you have an approach that is that hits directly to those five senses there is certainly going to be a way easier road in and that's what i would like to explore with my installation pieces that are you know visually um um, impactful, let's say. Um, and then the other way around uh, how the blockchain can help artists and your question of accessibility, I think maybe there may not be that much of a difference between a tokenized art piece than an artwork that is shared on Instagram in terms of the accessibility of experiencing the art. It, it's probably going to be easier to access it via Instagram than if it is a, a rare Pepe, for example, that, you know, it may not be that popular or, or that accessible. So accessibility, I mean, it, it depends on how we describe it. If, if we're talking about the access of ownership of the piece, well, then certainly accessibility is going to be the main thing in the blockchain. So I guess um, I, that brings me back to my idea of public space and, and public art and certainly Thinking, thinking about uh, crypto art as public art because it lives uh, in digital form that can be uh, reproduced massively into people's computers and iPhones or phones or tablets. And you can take a screenshot and kind of make it your own uh, without actually owning it. And I guess that's where uh, the hinge is or the, the limit is between what what level of accessibility are we talking about? Is it accessing the ownership of it or just the enjoyment of it? Um, and yes, I think uh, these conversations, if they are taking place in an environment that is creative, that it already sort of lends a certain feeling of we are talking about something that appeals to the senses, uh, it's going to make it even even more powerful. And that's why I'm making these things. I'm, um, with the community that, that I shared on Telegram, which is called uh, Art Project, <laughs> because it, it just started as a hashtag on a, a Slack channel. And they all start with hash, hash, hashtag something, you know? And it was just called Art Project. It was like the most organic thing in the world. Uh, and it just took us, took off as such. And it became uh, this kind of community that it's, you know, we are going to different places, like for example, East Denver. And uh, we invited this year, uh, we had um, Gus presenting his art, and then we invited people in the VR space into all sort of sharing this one room in a hackathon, providing hardware and software and bringing all these people together into almost also providing uh, to the rest of the hackathon, the means for being creative as well. And it was very successful. A lot of the people who were hacking things that had nothing to do with art ended up uh, coming upstairs to our makerspace, we call it the makerspace, and uh, you know, borrowing tools, borrowing hardware and experimenting there. And we bring um, you know, facilitators who know how to use the hardware 
stuff and it just you know it's kind of like enabling things to happen so yeah there the space is vibrant it's a win-win situation for for the art world and for the blockchain space as well so i will continue with two questions from the chat uh i would like to say hello to the community of ethereum caribe this is a new form uh meetup that is they are going to launch their first meetup in a few weeks. So we are saying hello to them through the streaming. And I'm going to add the question that I got from Camilo from Barranquilla and also Irol from Panama. I think they are going to point to the same direction. And I think this is good for Goose. People are wondering if we there already exists um, a place or a way to validate your artwork. So people can invest on that as user or as artist. So I know there's this second market that is being really bullish these times. And also Camilo wants to know what uh, galleries do you recommend to explore? So what do you think, Gus? Uh, sure. Uh, in order to validate, I think, uh, well, there are different things that are playing out at the moment. Uh, when it comes to tokenizing, content, any digital token, that's a very effective way of creating a sort of uh, timestamp that anyone can verify and it's almost impossible to counterfeit or, 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 um, or copy or, or, or falsify. So uh, that's it, it, in the blockchain, it works a little bit different than the real world or the traditional art markets in where an institution needs to go through steps to validate in the, uh, in the sense of, of uh, certifying that someone made this artwork in, cert in a certain time and maybe the provenance of ownership and so on and so forth. So uh, regarding validation as to certifying that I was the creator of this particular artwork, a very effective way of doing that is creating a token, creating a, a, a digital timestamp on the blockchain before anyone else. Uh, so all the incentives are from the creator side to, to mint one of these tokens before anyone else, before publishing your work in a way that everyone would be able to verify that you were the first one to, to certify. Obviously, everything has got flaws. So, for instance, if you publish an image before doing a token, it's possible that someone else creates a token and steals that image from you, steals in the sense of, of certifying it in the blockchain before you do. So, since the blockchain is the most immutable uh, database that we've known, uh, Putting, uh, being the first one to introduce certain content in the blockchain is a very effective way to, to validate uh, a timestamp in order to uh, argument in the future uh, where that painting or that artwork came from. And there are several platforms, inclu including ours, that, that in where you can do in where you can do that. Those are open, they are borderless. So from anywhere in the world, you can ask access one of these platforms like the Artist Liberation Front platform on Ethereum, which is alfwallet.com. If you go there, you can, in three very easy steps, you can create uh, a token from your digital content or on Bitcoin with artolin.org. But there are, there are a lot. And regarding the galleries, well, we are seeing more and more platforms that are, are doing the, that are playing the roles of the traditional market, but in a different way, in my opinion, in a better way. Because since this is an, uh, an open ecosystem, it, most of this is open source uh, software, it's very hard to hold a monopoly in the, the same way that the traditional markets do. So for instance, galleries in the traditional uh, uh, markets, well, they tend to have the contacts and uh, maybe the infrastructure and the resources to um, validate the, the, the artists that they want and to pump them into, into their collectors. 
But here, the galleries need to give you something else because otherwise you can just do it yourself. So what we are seeing is that platforms like Known Origin or Super Rare and all these platforms, they, they really need to, to, to provide with a valuable service to the artist. Otherwise, you don't use them. And that's what they are doing. Like we are seeing that an open platform like ours, uh, you still need to make all the, all the PR by yourself. You still need to get in contact with, with, uh, with potential uh, collectors in order to sell your artwork. But maybe these platforms, they, they help you in promoting your work. It helps you in, in going through the steps of minting your token, some of them, uh, to make it more easy and to paying the fees and to helping the, the, the newbies. Uh, so they have to provide this service. And, and through those platforms, you get visibility, you get, you get in touch with collectors, and, and, uh, and sometimes they, they get you access to, 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 to collectors with deep pockets. So um, I don't know if that answered the question. Uh, otherwise, let me know. Yeah, people in the chat, they said that they understood and they are really excited to check them. So uh, I, I have this question from before. Uh, I know you guys have been debating about we're creating a new type of market, but we are also coming to a monopoly. So for newcomers, they, artists, they need to get verified some KYC of your artwork. So I would like to know about Johnny's per perspective about that. If you agree with that, that some galleries are saying, please, we need to first check your previous work if you are not having a duplicate, but at the same time, they are getting a lot of power. Uh, yeah, well, I, I would, I'm, I'm hearing it in two ways. I hear the digital, um, but for the physical, I'll just say I've been a painter a long time and the galleries I work with, didn't give a shit about crypto for years until I told them, oh, we can do provenance with this token. And their eyes lit up and they're like, oh, really? We can make money. Like I can sell provenance. And that's when they cared. And really that's, you know, one of the things that really drives adoption is fear and greed. And let's never sell short that because that's really what got most of us into crypto. You know, don't, don't you know, let's, be honest. Um, so that being said, um, with the, the yeah, you know, we're all smiling because it's true. And, and we all talk about adoption. Next bull run comes, the greed will come. When the dollar crashes, the fear will come. They're coming. We're just building for them. That's really, I feel like what we need to focus on, build the infrastructure because it's coming. Um, that being said, um, as far as the digital art galleries. I used to be decentralization was like my religion. That was like mantra. Oh, it's not decentralized. It's bullshit. You know, oh, decentral. But I realized, you know, it serves a purpose. You know, decentralization is the tool. It's not the outcome. You know, it's like, it's like the cart before the horse. You know, we're using decentralization to achieve outcomes. And these outcomes might be freedom, you know, uh, more liberty, more democratic art, or just independence for yourself. And that being said, the new galleries, some of them they serve a purpose of curation. Because I've had friends come to look at digital art, and then there's just thousands of artists and thousands of images. And, and let's be honest, some of it, it's, you know, some, some people just sneeze on a napkin and say, hey, it's art. And they tokenize it and then they're putting it up to sell, you know, being a little exaggerated. But we need curation. We need, you know what I'm saying? We, we you know, it serves a purpose. We should have, I don't believe anyone should be silenced. I think everyone should be able to mint their tokens. But I should also be able to go to a place where someone that has a good eye that I trust can, you know, save me some time and say, hey, check out this art. You know, that serves a purpose if you want it. Um, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I, and okay. I would like to add something small to that because that's very true. Uh, for the first time in, in, in my experience, we are experimenting with no curation, with no referee, with, uh, with completely open platforms like the ones we are, we are developing. And, and then you realize some of the reasons why 
we need the other players in the ecosystem. Like once you realize you are your own boss, you also realize which are your own limitations. And, and, and therefore, as Johnny just pointed out, uh, if there's no curation at all, uh, most of the collectors, they just get confused. Uh, or there's people abusing the platforms, making fakes, uh, stealing images from other people and, 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 and trying to sell them uh, as their own. So there's definitely, we are realizing in the completely anarchy of cyberspace that a need for rules inside a particular uh, niche is required for the well functioning of, of that community. And that's very valuable because those rules are coming from, from the need of those rules, not because they are imposed. We, we came to the conclusion that we, re, we need this or, or, or that. That's very valuable, the way it's, it's, it's coming to, um, into being. Um, for me, I was going to add there something. Go ahead, Jessica. Um, so yes, that's actually a great valid point that Johnny brought in terms of curation. And I do agree with that. Nevertheless, I would expect to see a little bit more experimentation in the space regarding complete freedom of just like having everything. And I understand that for a collector, there is it's going to be really hard to just navigate through all the noise, let's say. Uh, the way that I would think about it is that as long as there is a continuous sort of participation on tokenizing, uploading, bringing content uh, by whoever it is uh, motivated to do that, then that practice itself uh, sort of will decant or uh, be a filter it's going to be like an organic filter that happens by itself if you start uh sort of limiting who goes in because it is offensive or not offensive or because it drew something that may not be oh uh, i don't know cool or whatever and you start curating in a a, a, a space like the blockchain space which its main ethos is Censorless, uh, non-censoring. Um, I don't know. I don't. I don't think it's the best thing to do. I understand why would people would do it. A platform like Super Rare or others to whitelist because they want to have a good, you know, quality art for people to buy. Yes, of course, it's a business, and I I respect that. But it would be nice to see something more experimental and see how uh, that openness and even that. Uh, offensive content that may appear will lead to certain conversations to start to happen by the openness of it and then who is sort of going to win that battle and I think the battle will be won by whoever brings more, more content to the table over and over until it makes its you know point visually um, and yeah I guess I guess we're not seeing that yet um, that's one um, of the main reasons I'm Oh, sorry. Well, I just want to ask one question because I'm not, I'm not from the art space at all. And I keep hearing this word, which I loosely know what it means, but I don't, I realize I really don't know what it means. Curation. So like, what, what is that normally help me understand why that's important in the traditional art market? Anyway. I, I would say it means, it means a, a process of, of whitelisting. Think of the curator almost as a, a little bit of a gatekeeper, uh, the person who decides who goes and who doesn't go. Uh, and the curator is, I'm, I'm not demeaning curators, it's a very interesting practice. As a curator, you can be creative and there are curators who are interested in a certain kind of art and they can create really interesting narratives. And it is a research that the curator makes in order to reach artists who are really interesting. And he, he or she collects different things that all together can create, you know, bring a message forth. So curation is interesting, uh, but when a decentralized platform is curating the content, then, well, there is no freedom of, you know, putting your, putting everything up. 
does that answer your question? So a curator is a person who selects. So are, do they get to, this is gonna sound bad, but do they get to decide what is art or what is legitimate art to a certain subset or group of people? Is that the way to look at it? To a certain extent, I do think curators do shape what is believed to be art and what not, depending mm -hmm. on their status. Okay. Like, yeah, that, that, that's, that. true, that's true for the for the for the real world for the, the physical traditional world. art world yeah, the traditional that. art world yes. but, but in my opinion the main difference uh between the real world and what we are seeing happening in, on the internet is that different platforms and different uh cu curators standards are not exclusive like in the physical world because in the physical world you have a gallery that maybe it has it has a, a certain reach and it has a, a maybe a soft monopoly on, on certain uh, uh, area, but in the in, in the internet there's no exclusion. Like you can go into a gallery right. and if you don't like it, you can access as easily uh, uh, into another platform. And what we were just discussing yesterday with my colleague, uh, fellow artists here, Mr. Monk and Moxara, that they are here, is that different platforms are. Um, adopting different styles. So in my point of view, there's, there, I think there's room for everyone. Like those guys that are that, that are feeling rejected by the platforms, they're doing their own platforms or they are selling peer to peer. Yes, um, to so peer take, take me for example, um, mm -hmm. I was on a waiting list. So um, if anybody's on a waiting list, my, um, my advice to you is the blockchain space moves very fast and you have really no time to wait at all. Um, I, I made my, that's why, I, that's how I made my discord is because uh, I was on this waiting list and I did not want to wait. So I just went ahead and did it myself. And now I have some of the CEOs of these platforms in my discord. So there really is, I still have a network around them. You know? so, so can I ask two questions real quick? What are you waiting on? And can you give me examples of these platforms? I'm not from the art world at all. So I'm really just trying to understand. Can, your I, space can I chime in? Um, sure, sure, Jenny, please. I just wanted to clarify for the guy that's not in the art world, the curation might be confusing. Curation can be a gatekeeper, but you could also think of the radio DJ as a curator. You know, he's curating music. Your Spotify algorithm is a curator. Okay. That's a curator. I, I, okay. Okay. Um, right. And if you remember, anyone remember the internet before Google? It was just like you had to like bookmark something or you'd never find never it. Never find it again. I do remember that. Yeah. Um, that's kind of what I'm talking about. And if anyone's interested, I made the artist liberation front, we made the artist unleashed contract so anyone could mint. And I had so much, like I was freedom-minded, censorship resistant. Man, I got some crazy people minting stuff. Minting, I was getting phone calls, complaints. And, you know, I backed up the, the independence. And I put that thing, I sent the ownership to a burn address. That meant I no longer control that contract. And I put it up on IPFS. I put it on BitTorrent. And I made it unstoppable. I made it uncurated and no one can stop it because I didn't like being the curator, especially in this space. Cause there's anonymous people that, you know, I'm, a, you know, I'm pseudonymous. My face is in public. There's people out there. They're completely anonymous making really rough art and then upset that they're being censored or you're not putting them on your platform. The thing is like, like uh, Red said, he made his own platform. He was like, okay. I so, that, that so, so let me ask. So let me ask the question. Maybe I'll answer my own question. So is like super rare the platform, and you're waiting to get admitted to super rare? Is that the way to think about it, or no? That that definitely has happened. Uh, I, I know a couple of people that are in the waiting list of super rare. Okay. Uh, so that I'm I'm more so the, the guy that was speaking earlier. He said he was he was waiting. And I said, what are you waiting for and waiting on a platform? Oh, so no. I, I, I was waiting. I was waiting to be, you know, to have just my stuff uploaded on there. And the fact that I had to wait while, you know, the blockchain space 
is still going on, I really have no time. So what I did was made, I'm, you know, made my own uh, Discord server where I network outside of Discord, Instagram, Twitter, just inviting people based on, you know. So, so you said you were waiting on, I'm, I'm just sorry, I don't know what you were waiting on. Like what's, what blockchain? Oh, so, um, these, some of these platforms have a, a waiting list in order to put your stuff on the, on the, okay. on their platform. Oh, okay. Can you, okay. I mean, I don't know if they I'm just interested. So I don't want to take up the whole conversation. I love to know what these platforms are and thanks for, you know, there just seems to be a lot. And if you can oh. even share your discord server, I just love to just come and look and learn. Yeah. So I, 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 I've already shared the link, but discord is one of the, um, main ones where you don't get censored at least, uh, like Facebook and YouTube, what's going on in, on YouTube right now and Twitter. Yeah. Oh um, yeah. I use Discord just in general for crypto, but I've yeah. had more so than like the, the link to the server. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I've, I've shared that on the chat. You could go. Ahead. Oh, okay. I guess I don't see. Okay. I just need to find the chat. Yeah, okay. Yeah, sure. Oh, I okay. I see. Awesome. Thank you everybody. Sorry for taking up so much time. Uh, I wanted to yeah. add that, may I? Um, Super Rare was not whitelisting before when it started. So it's a good sign that this is happening. It means a lot of people are getting in, you know? Yeah, definitely. And, and I would like to go back maybe later when we, uh, 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 when we have the chance to talk about adoption. Like this is the year of the adoption in the, in the, in the crypto art world. Is, is growing so fast. I, 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 uh, I am by no means a very active or very productive artist uh, compared to, to, to my fellow artists here. Like uh, there's people just going in through the, a lot of platforms at the same time. And, uh, and some of those platforms, they really serve a purpose. They are giving a lot of exposure to their artists. And, uh, and one of the guys in our collective just sold a few thousand dollars last weekend. So uh, it, it's like uh, the platforms are being forced to serve a purpose, to give you a product, a service, a valuable service. Uh, otherwise, there's there's no point in, in going there. And, and and we are seeing a lot of adoption. So it's, get, it's getting fulfilled because more and more and more people are jumping into into this ecosystem because it's it's uh, it's it's possible to monetize your digital content for the first time in history. So yeah. actually, that's kind of a perfect segue uh, because my next question was going to be with like this year of adoption as as you've described it, um, and you can speak a little bit about that. But specifically, my question more is what new sets of issues facing crypto galleries in this new, what are the new issues facing crypto galleries in this whole new art marketplace, like with this boom uh, in the space? Well, I believe that right now the main issues are maybe uh, the, the, the tech barrier uh, for, for newcomers. Uh, that's definitely, I think, that's that's been like the main problem that applies to all the blockchain ecosystem. Yeah, like with mask and all that. Exactly, like like people to understand that they need to back up their wallets and they need to 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 save their private keys and store them in a in a safe place outside the internet. Like a friend of mine the other day just sent me a screenshot, uh, a photo. I mean, of her seed green and on paper. <laughs> like. <laughs> so, so it's very hard to, to make that the average guy to understand the importance of, of doing this right. Otherwise you will lose your funds. That's one of the main barriers, but that applies to, to all the ecosystem. The fees are another problem, but we've been seeing that the fees problem since 2017. Now it's happening on Ethereum as well. Uh, it happened with Bitcoin. Fees are too high and that's killing a lot of projects. Um, and uh, well, I don't know. For the fees, I will say from a technical perspective, um, I think I'm not saying this is like a tomorrow thing, but I wouldn't be surprised if by end of the year, a lot of these platforms or just anyone that's hooking into Ethereum 
all these layer two, like Starkware, um, loop ring, uh, and, and some of these ZK, um, these are very technical sort of things, but they're, once they get integrated into these existing platforms, you're gonna, you should, in theory, see a drastic reduction in fee costs. And I think right now there is a literal race to integrate existing platforms, not so much directly to, to Ethereum, you know, but even to these L2s and how is MetaMask going to act with that? So I think there's a lot of work going on in that space. And by the end of the year, I wouldn't be surprised if they really, really get the fees down to something because it is they do see that it's it's going to it stop the momentum in 17. And if they don't address it here in the next three to four months, it's going to stop the momentum for everything that's going on with Ethereum. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we are all crossing our fingers for the, for this to come as early as possible. Uh, it, it didn't happen with Bitcoin as fast as we would have liked to, but hopefully, yeah, it's coming. It's coming. You couldn't have built this on Bitcoin. <laughs> That's the other thing. Uh, well, I mean, you, you couldn't? You, are you saying? Well, I mean, everything on Ethereum is driven with smart contracts and tokens and NFT is a representation of such a token. You couldn't have built any of these things that we're talking about, these platforms on top of Bitcoin. It's just, it's not about not like, it's just the mechanisms and the technology, it wasn't built for that purpose, right? Things like Ethereum, Cardano, Tezos, pretty much without a smart contract and without the ability to create tokens, you can't build any of this sort of digital art as we're talking about uh yeah i mean i i, I don't want to go into my maximalist uh, <laughs> uh, uh character but 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 you're true like ethereum is 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 definitely focused for for building these kind of apps on top and bitcoin is not even though uh, in theory is possible uh, i mean there are projects all the crypto art comes from bitcoin that the first uh art markets uh, tokenizing uh, artwork before nfts was even a thing like the, the 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 nft concept was not even out there and and we were doing that back in bitcoin but you're right at the same time that's not the purpose of bitcoin so it's way it's, it will always be uh, an uphill task to try to do these things in bitcoin rather than if you Bitcoin had a waiting list and Vitalik didn't want to wait, so he made Ethereum. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, Jessica, Red, uh, Johnny, do you have any uh, other input on n new issues you see arising with this boom in adoption? You mean outside of gas costs? Um, yeah. yeah, just in general, anything you, you see. I mean, in general, you know, we're still defining this space and I'm going to speak maybe blasphemous right now, but in a sense, yeah. NFTs are bullshit. And I'm a guy that's been making them for years. I mean, most artists that are selling them and making them don't even know what they are or what they're selling or how they work. They're like, oh, I put art on the blockchain. No, you didn't, you know, or, you know, you're, you know, they're selling a token. You know, kind of like a token of affection is not your affection. It's just a token. And really, if we don't build the infrastructure, you know, it's kind of like, I mean, kind of like saying an album or an old school phonograph album isn't the music. It's one of the pieces that delivers the music. You know, the, it's just, you know, you need electricity, you need this, you need the record player, and you need a standard of 33 and a half rotations per second and the standard is really what will give this longevity if we really build like a standard for these tokens so no matter what happens these tokens can kind of endure if that makes sense where i'm going with this because otherwise this could be you know just a thing that comes and goes to the next chain or yeah that's my thought uh, I, i'm gonna i'm gonna quote one of my my fellow artist uh, who said, NFTs are just moving drawings. <laughs> you know who you are. Uh, but, but yeah, uh, so it's true. Like, like you're, you're just selling a moving drawing. 
But it's not just that, obviously. It's not just a drawing, it's not just a token. It's all the infrastructure and, and the implications of that timestamp on the blockchain that anyone would be able to verify it forever and ever, right? So it's the whole thing moving together. Yeah. And technically, oh, I was going to say, you're not even selling a drawing. You're selling a token that has an address the drawing, to a drawing. Yeah. That's somewhere else. Like it's you're just it's like selling a piece of paper and saying, Oh, here, the art's at my house, but here you can have this and now it's yours. You know, but like, that, that's part of the art you're describing. I mean, the standard you're describing, right? When you say standard, you mean not technical? Because like 721 is a technical standard, 1155 is a ERC eleven fifty five is a technical the, standard. The standard I'm speaking of is more the metadata and how oh, we create right. the metadata. Oh yeah, I agree with like as far as if this is digital art, you need these this metadata associated. That's an excellent point. Yeah, for sure. So I kind of brought this question up because I had recently watched this documentary, I think on Netflix, it was called uh, There Are No Fakes. And it was about this Canadian artist, Norva Norval Morisot, and how uh, someone had bought one of his paintings from a gallery um, and it comes, come to find out it was like a fake painting. It was like a fraud apparently. And, um, it, and it had this fake history of ownership too attached to it. So it was like this whole thing, you know, it was, a, apparently it's a huge problem in Canada with these Norval, uh, Morriso paintings, um, that, they have kind of flooded the market with fakes. So that's kind of why I brought this up. And, you know, I think NFTs, I know you're kind of describing that they're bullshit, but uh, in a way, you know, we're getting at some of, we're getting at solutions for some of these problems, you know, tracking history of ownership and like uh, minting like an, an original so it can be tracked back to the artist. So I, I think there's power in what we're doing. But I agree with Johnny in the sense that we're not quite there yet, you know. Uh, Cody, I wanted to add something else there uh, that may be worth mentioning. There's a project called async.art, and they're doing uh, kind of programmable options for owners of tokens. The way it works is uh, kind of by layers. So I can create a masterpiece that is made out of different layers. And every layer is a token, and it can be purchased by different people. Uh, but what's interesting is that it's bringing in a new sort of kind of fun thing that I think has potential uh, of uh, allowing the owner of the token to choose from different options for this uh, layer to look. So you as an artist can say, OK, these options are going to be three different colors or it moves to this side or to this other side, giving the owner of the token a certain interactive element with the art. So that's pretty cool. Actually, I was talking to them about maybe doing something, tokenizing the lighting of an installation so an owner of the token could decide what color the light would have in the work. As I was that's saying, like maybe exploring ways of installation art and tokens. Uh, so that's something that we discussed then that is actually possible with using that platform. That's awesome. Thank you for bringing that yeah. up. Mm -hmm. um, Juan, uh, or Red, did you have anything to add about problems you see? Or... Um, no, I'm just, just listening to you guys, really. I'm okay. very blown away by what... You said what problems? Uh, yeah, well, we were kind of talking about like... Uh, oh, okay, I see. Yeah, the issues facing crypto galleries. Yeah. So I was just bringing. You yeah, it, it's all it, from from a from an artist's point of view. It's more about just if you have an obstacle in your way, find a way to get around it. That's that's my perspective. Um, yeah. Interesting. Well, Juan, did you want to do the five minute break still, or keep pushing through? Yeah, I was first. I would like to say that the discussion was like really good until this part. I was like just like really enjoying the different points. I'm really glad for that. Thank you for the speakers and the audience with the questions. So yeah, we were thinking about to have 
it's 4 15 here so i have a five minutes break for you go like to grab some coffee go to the bathroom or anything you need to do and let's see in five minutes and let's continue with the with the talk sounds good yeah sounds good okay great So while you guys come back from the break, I just want to mention that we're using Cognosis, which is the platform that will allow us to recognize all the knowledge that we're getting in this conversation. So in the, in the left part of your screen, you can see a list of the participants. You have 100 claps to distribute or to assign. So yeah, this is like 
a way to recognize things that you have learned, things that you uh, would like to, yeah, say, I, I really like what this person said. So you have this 100 claps to acknowledge, and then this is going to create a aggregate amount of uh, a, ba a balance, let me say, and that result will uh, distribute the funds to your uh, wallets. So just for you, for the people that are new to the platform, that's the thing that we're proposing. This is a methodology for everyone to uh, add to the conversation. And this has been like really interesting so far. Uh, so let's go back to the conversation. Uh, I would like to, Baron, can you talk? So let's check if you're... Yeah, uh, you yeah, I wanted to test my mic and uh, say that I really like this approach of like, uh, sharing what like the this entry fee just like, spread across everyone just as a small token of appreciation uh, for those who contribute so this is awesome so thank you I i'm glad i can join there you, you go. Yeah. hello everyone yeah hi Byron. yeah we're really uh, glad would you like to to introduce yourself to get to know you more a bit and also you were having some great uh yeah thoughts on the on the chat Oh yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, sure, uh, I'll, I'll make it really short. So my, my background is uh, video, motion graphics, and uh, VFX as well, and a bit of photography. And uh, and at some point I I was not satisfied with um, the potential I had with like a real camera. It's too complicated to have like a whole team and, and everything in cinema. So I figured I would learn 3D um, to get more freedom. And uh, since then I've been uh, working in animation and also installative work. So I try to present the LCD screen as a portal. It's the portal that we use to access the virtual world at the, at this moment, essentially. And um, I find it a bit dull, a bit weird. It's a bit weird that it's just a glass and that we cannot manipulate it, we cannot feel from it. And, and so I, I'm trying to present it uh, in, in different ways as if it was tangible, as, as, as we, if we could imagine it as uh, something that we could um, transform and, and, and manipulate as, as uh, if it was real, essentially. And um, so I've been doing short animations, virtual worlds, and uh, to me, blockchain is a manifestation of uh, how we can give this tangibility to data that I'm interested in, and we can kind of emulate it and explore what it means when we tie it to digital art. So, so this is what I've uh, started to explore with a, a new series. And uh, I made a small, um, I'll say like a portal to this series that I will link in the chat right now. So yeah, and there's a, a small description at the end of this as well. So th uh, thank you for, for letting me introduce my work and um, I'll be happy to uh, contribute to the rest of the discussion as well. Awesome. We're really glad to see you and to hear you. Um, so I would like to take uh, some of the questions that we have from one of the Telegram groups. I would like to thank the people from Barranquilla, Colombia. They are creating that meetup. So this is a common effort. We are talking with people from Pittsburgh, but here in Colombia, things are happening on the Ethereum ecosystem. So I'm really glad to have people from Barranquilla joining the conversation. Uh, and I would like to move the conversation more to the practical part. I know that we have been talking about like more abstract ideas about what is art and quality and decentralization, but I would like to kickstart with the topic of VR galleries and museums. Someone from East Caribe wants to know if there are some, I mean, we already know that there are, but just like a basic introduction about how these things work. So whoever wants to jump in, feel free. Um, I can take that one. Um, yeah, it's very exciting what's happening this year because uh, maybe last year they were already maybe one or two platforms, uh, uh, mean, meaning these, these galleries that we know, uh, playing around with, with virtual worlds. But actually, uh, on February with Jessica here, we were in East Denver and we saw that Super Rare had their own uh, basic uh, VR gallery, but it was more like they were like just experimenting with new things. But then it came the the the, the pandemic, and uh, and one of the most interesting um, Bitcoin conferences in San Francisco uh, that happens every year. The, this year was programmed by the end of March, 
and it was canceled like everything else. So Cody, one of the artists, uh, decided to organize a massive uh, show in crypto voxels that is a VR world based on, on Ethereum. And, uh, and a lot of us, we, we just realized that this was a very, very um, important uh, merge of technologies because uh, what blockchain was meant for, in a sense, taking the world from, from, uh, 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 from Team May is that cryptography is like, like the walls on the, on the virtual world. It's what gives uh, strength uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the chaos of, of the numbers and the math. Without cryptography, there's no hierarchy between digital objects. But cryptography brings this solidity to, to the objects that make them special, that make them unique. So is the, the virtual worlds without the blockchain are just games. There's the, the, you are just playing in a platform. But with the economics of the blockchain, you can have a, a richer ecosystem. And we all realized this back, well, most of us, we realized this back in, in, in March when we saw the first big uh, show, art show in, in crypto voxels. And for the past months since March, we've seen dozens of exhibitions. I don't know how many. I mean four already right now. And, uh, and, and, and I think it, it, uh, it, it, it's going to take the, especially, specifically the art, the crypto art uh, ecosystem, it's going to take him to, a, to the next level because we have investors interested, people from the traditional markets interested in building uh, uh, um, virtual platforms. And because they can monetize it, the institutional money is coming now in, in, through, this, through this door. Uh, so the marriage between these two technologies, blockchain and virtual reality, is going to be very strong. We already saw that the blockchain and, and, and crypto tokens and NFTs and augmented reality was a, was a good merge because you can show with your app, with your, uh, with your phone, you can show how the digital object looks like through a print or a, or a, or a physical object. But now with also uh, the, the virtual galleries and the virtual experience, it just makes it more rich. And it, I think a lot of what's happening in crypto art this year is uh, from this year on is just going to move into virtual worlds. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a, 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 a hub for all of us to, to experiment and, and, and develop our, our job. Yeah. Um, can I jump in there? <laughs> sure. uh, okay, so I wanted to share with you. Um, I'm gonna have to to leave you guys, unfortunately, at 5:30. I have two minutes to stay. Uh, but before I go, I want to share uh, this virtual uh, reality sort of project that I'm working on that is related with, to the Vancouver Biennial, and also invite you to reach out to me if you think this is interesting. That there are ways of collaborating and participating. Um, so, um, uh, let's see if I can share my screen. Uh, yes, there we go. Uh, so do you guys see it? Yes. Okay, perfect. So these are the works that I do that I mentioned the takeover spaces and the installation pieces that I create. And then uh, this one that I'm, these are all physical spaces. Wait, 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 wait. I, I think it went I don't blank. See it. Your, yeah, yeah, I, I, we yeah, just see a green I screen, see a I think. Screen. Yeah. What, what do you see? Just a green screen. Oh, that's strange. It's like, um, yeah, it's, a, <laughs> it's just your, just all an right. icon. Uh, Looks like you lost your video. Okay, we see you now. Oh, it's back. Oh, that's strange. Uh, do, you, do you see your faces? <laughs> yes. Yes, we see you now. Let me know if this works. Do you see? Yeah. Yeah. Ah, okay, okay, cool. Perfect. Yeah, because it's kind of hard to describe something that is visual just with words. But um, these are the spaces that I that I make, the installation spaces. Uh, 
And the Vancouver Biennale project is at the south side of the Camby Street Bridge. But because of COVID, I think this ties in nicely with uh, the subject, we were not able to install it this summer. Uh, so we are holding off to next year to do the installation, but instead we're using the 3D model that I created with the design of the bridge uh, to put it as a virtual reality space that everyone in the world can attend. This will be launched on uh, November this year. And we are also putting together a, a digital arts kind of festival expo along uh, with the launch of the VR bridge. So you will be hearing more about this soon. Uh, but what I wanted to do is just kind of show you what I was doing and invite you to reach out to me if you want to learn more about this. Uh, the uh, expo is in November and we're going to have workshops, talks, uh, different discussions around art and blockchain and physical spaces, virtual reality spaces. We're going to have with um, uh, a uh, rare AF uh, you know, organizer, uh, kind of a, a tour around all the virtual spaces in November. So yeah, I want to invite you to that. And so I'm just going to drop uh, my email here. And uh, for anyone who wants to reach out to me, and I'm really sorry, I have to go, but um, I hope this is recorded. Will it be recorded so I can continue seeing what happened? Yeah, here it's going to be recorded. Yes. yes. Okay. Yep. Nice talking to you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jessica. That was yes. awesome. Thank you. Um, you have a great day. I'm going, but keep it, keep having fun. <laughs> Jessica, before you leave, don't forget to yeah. send your claps. Oh, I can you do can that. Do oh, great. Yeah. Awesome. I will do that. Excellent. Awesome. And remember, just like do it one time. I mean, for also for people that are using for the first time, because usually you start like to do it partially. So you have to do it once, just like one shot. So it was interesting that she was showing, um, has anyone here heard of Somnium Space? No. Yes, I've heard. So I, I found it, it's an interesting project I've just been observing. Uh, and it really, I've been watching it since I feel like October maybe because they actually have like a built world, right? A lot of people in crypto are like, oh, we're gonna do all these things. But the interesting thing is when you talk about art, they've been able to already bring in actual NFTs into the world. So they, I know they did like crypto kitties and you could have other NFTs in their world. So my, like, what do you guys think about a virtual world like Somnium or even, sorry, shh, something like uh, whether Somnium or Decentraland or what have you, but you have these NFTs which to let you bring it into the, like some sort of digital art into that world. They, they've they done, to me, based on my, my observation, they've done the best job of bringing in like NFTs into the world as they are, whatever that representation is. So I just find that very interesting. I don't know if anybody's observed. They, I think even someone there has an art gallery. Yeah, um, have you, do you know, are you, do you know anyone by the name of a natural warp? No. Oh, well, he, he, he got me familiar with uh, Somnium Space. And okay. uh, my, one of my works was actually in his gallery, and I thought it was the coolest thing. Oh, so he has a gallery in Somnium or just in general? Yeah, he has a digital, uh, like a virtual gallery in Somnium. Oh, wow. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, I, I downloaded the client when it first came out, and I played with it a little bit. It actually works, but... I, I'm just very fascinated with the project because it they already have the virtual world and then they're letting you bring in virtual objects and it's like it's real in that world, right? So that perspective just makes me really interested in what they're doing. Yeah, they have uh, they have links on YouTube too. So if no one knows what we're talking about, it's they they have videos on YouTube where I think they record yeah. they record weekly. Or oh yeah, they do. That's I, I watch a lot of those videos on YouTube. I'll just put the link to, to just like their Twitter, and you can find everything on there. Um, it's it's a really in, the the videos are, you know, everything going on with COVID. The other thought I was having was just like, someone could like build a 
a building or something on there and people can have like meetings, right? And when you see the videos of people interacting, it's very fluid with the hands and the VR. You don't need the VR, but just it just feels as real as you can get. And you know, yeah, I like how it looks like they're holding a smartphone. Yeah, like, like, like for doing them. selfies and things like that. Yeah, it's really interesting. So. Yeah, actually, I ha actually I have some images to share with you guys, and I can go through the different VR worlds that we we have. Uh, oh, okay. cool. we have art shows in there. So, but, but uh, before Chen, I would like to yeah. hear like Baron uh, raise his hand. So, I'd just like to before like changing topic or like to go in, to not go further. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, can you hear me well? Uh, Yes. 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 Okay. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I have a, a small question and a comment as well. Um, like I, I've been into VR since 2016, and I, I like VR, and it's it's great. But I, I think like we are all early adopters here, and I think uh, art needs to be accessible first. Like that's that's the basic. Uh, it, it has to be accessible to everyone. So to me, those VR platforms, it's it's promising, it's interesting, and I want to be part of this, but. I think at the moment it's not the priority. And my question is, as far as uh, NFTs uh, that are integrated in, in those spaces, as far as I understand it, they just import the image and they refer to the like super rare API or something like that. But the link, I, I think, I'm not sure because I'm not an expert in that field, but I, I don't think there is a direct link with like, suppose they sell the art, the image would disappear. Like I, I really doubt it. And I'm curious well, to to hear more about this. Well, the, the you, can, you can do both. Real, real quick, is they brought in like a crypto kitty, and it wasn't a picture; it was an actual crypto kitty, right? Like moving around. So um, I don't know. It probably differs for every NFT as far as how they bring that in to be represented. But that's an excellent point about how they bring that in. Yeah, I I'm think you can uh, you can do both. You can both import the, just the, just a digital image, but you can also in a, in a platform like the Central Land, you can link to the NFT in a way that I guess if I mean you can, you buy it, so so the the NFT will change from one address to the other. It will still show there, but now it's owned by someone else. Yeah. So, Baron, uh, I understand how you said uh, art is art has to literally come first because I feel like it's it's like it's like putting uh, medicine inside uh, a, almost like a sugary donut. You, you're the under the underlining is blockchain, and to have people understand it and not have it intimidate them is very, very, very hard. So. Having us be in this um, little art niche is is a good way to experiment with, you know, adding sugar on top of this medicine that is a blockchain. And uh, about accessibility, yeah. um, it's funny you brought that up because that's another reason why I work with QR codes. And uh, QR codes are, in in my opinion, um, it it. It's useful in the blockchain world as uh, as a form of uh, you could try and you could make an address with the QR code or in the future it's going to be your identity is going to be a, a QR code. But right now we we're in this um, we're in this uh, time frame where QR codes are already out there, but people don't see any artistic value in them yet, or even look at them as photos. Just you know, barcode. That's what they look at it right now. How how I feel. Uh, yeah, I I want to Johnny to go because he raised his hand. Are you muted? Oh, I think you're muted. Uh, thanks. My computer was acting up. Um, well, this was to uh, Baron's point a little earlier. When you were asking about like the image disappeared when it was sold and whatnot, um, as I've mentioned earlier, NFTs aren't the art, and like I'd really recommend that artists kind of figure out how they work because I can put an NFT or an image of any NFT on my own crypto voxels or anywhere I want. I don't need their permission. The image it just exists in the web. The NFT is just kind of like a deed of ownership. 
it doesn't really like you can make multiple tokens from the same image. I mean, the same image location. I can make one of your a token of one of your images. It'd be a counterfeit, but not technically because the image would be the same image. It would actually reference the same server space, the same address, the same hash. Um, so really, it's it's just we're just selling tokens like a number on the blockchain until people put art in the blockchain, which you can do, you know, blasphemously on Bitcoin SV if you wanted because it has big blocks. But even then, it would just be like, what's the point? You know, um, you're just putting it online. Um, I, I know I know uh, Cody wants to respond because and, and I'd like to hear his input on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I just have a question. It's not it's not critical or anything, but like and forgive me if this is naive. I really I'm brand new to this space, you know, just talking to you guys is how I've been learning. Is there a way in which people do, or do you know of any artists who will like mint for example like your cookies painting, right? As an NFT and then they would ship you the actual painting so that you own the NFT. Yes, I keep interrupting. <laughs> I need to use this platform more, but yeah. But yeah, or, um, who was that question toward? I'm sorry. It was, it was, it was to you. So I was curious. Uh, do, oh, yeah. do you know of artists doing using a process like sure, that? Sure. Uh, Codex is was doing something like that. Uh, absolutely. If you hang on one second, I'll show you what uh, something I've done. Yeah, I would love to. I've actually put NFTs on floppy disks. You've uh, and added them to the painting. I've merged them in. You could, yeah, you could do all kinds of stuff because the NFT is just like a few bytes of data. Right. Um, right. Um, but yeah, like Codex. There's other people have like made stickers like those. Um, uh, NFC stickers, I, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly, that you can scan that stores a little bit of data and they put like hologram stickers on paintings. A lot of people are experimenting with it. Um, at the end of the day, they all have value. They're gimmicky because I was, like I said, very excited for all this a few years back. Like decentralization was my mantra and I was all about it, militant. And I was like talking to devs. And I was learning. I was like, well, I want to make this and I can do it with this token. They were telling me about it. Then they explained that I was like, oh, you could do that with centralization even easier. Or like this, you know, this process is basically what galleries and curators do now. Like they verify that this painting is real or this certificate of authentication is real. It's kind of like the same thing. You know, we have it really move the ball forward with that is that's my only critique of it and, and i'm really excited like jessica brought up async like we're doing some really cool new art now and it's monetizing it but the artists don't really get what they're selling you're just selling a token and um does that does that answer any questions yeah it, cool. it does and so these things are super cool by the way um i highly recommend I'd like to bring them back. Um, <laughs> so to kind of keep the conversation moving forward. Um, so like I, I, this idea of like VR during COVID is really interesting, especially like the work that Jessica has been doing. And I would love to see some of what uh, Gus has in terms of like what he's been working on with his galleries. Um, I had never tried VR until COVID. I bought an Oculus so I could test it out. And so my first experience was like one of the first apps I downloaded was this um, Salvador Dali app and it had all of his works and his paintings so you could interact with them in a virtual world. So my question to all of the uh, uh, speakers are, um, do you feel more connected using a technology like this during COVID? Do you think there's added value using it? Or do you think in the end, it just leads to a disconnection with the artist and its work? Um, so I'd love to hear your guys' input on that. Well, I, I do feel like a, like a plus. Uh, I mean, definitely I can't see a dystopic future. I think it's already happening somewhere, 
in where people are just going to be plugged to their headsets 24-7. I mean, obviously, every new technology has its downsides and, and things that we should be concerned about. But uh, uh, right now, I, I see it as a very useful tool. I, 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 I've made so many new friends uh, in the, in, during this pandemic, online friends, just playing around with this technology and 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 in regular uh, 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 chats in regular chat rooms. So uh, I, I in my in my experience, it's a it's a plus. It's it's pretty positive. Awesome, good to hear. Yeah, yeah. I agree. It's definitely a plus, and I I think the main appeal is that uh, you can meet people uh, based on their interests rather than just uh, um, having this geographic limit. Um, so it's, I don't think it's here to threaten or to replace real life or any of that, but it's it augments it and it creates more connections. So it's yeah, definitely a plus. Mm -hmm. It makes it easier to collaborate as well. Like we, we've seen this uh, with music a lot, like artists just send stems to each other and they collaborate and create tracks within minutes even. Uh, and like from a creative uh, point of view, like this is the what we want, like to be able to create easier and uh, collaborate easier. Yeah. So that's what well, that's about covid like i feel like when it came to just tech it accelerated everybody who was already on who was already working from home like we had people who didn't know what it felt like to even work in their house so then they you know for for us who for well most of us who already work it further accelerated and to stay at home was very, very normal for me. Um, I already ordered things on Amazon. I really didn't have to go outside that much. I tried going outside, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, COVID really accelerated. Um, I don't know if it's good or bad. That's the thing. It, too much acceleration is bad. Yeah, I kind of see what you're saying, Red. Um, I, and I come from a similar position. like. I had already been working remotely for over a year when COVID hit, so it wasn't that big of an adjustment, but it was cool to experiment with new technology and like kind of forge those new connections with people during that time. Yes. Um, Sitting in your house, you, you know, it, it, make, it, it allows you to, you know, there's no other excuse, I would say, to not learn something as, as huge and groundbreaking as this technology. So we are, we are not wasting our time, that's what I'm saying. We're not wasting our time networking with each other and knowing that there are like-minded people out there. Uh, Gus, um, now would be a great time to share some of those galleries that you've been working on, if you wanted to. Of course. Yeah, let me see if I can share my screen. Yeah, here, perfect. So um, can you see my screen here? Yep. yep. Okay. So this is the one, the, the first, uh, the first uh, art show that we organized, me and a couple of guys here, Mr. Monk and Moxarra were involved. This was our first approach to a VR world art show. This was back in maybe, I don't know, it was like three months ago. So uh, I think I have a small, a small video. Um, yeah, I think here. So yeah, this is a. Uh, you you can see crypto. I'm I'm gonna make us a, a, a quick comparison between the platforms available right now. So this is crypto voxels. It's very simple. Uh, you can see it from your smartphone. Like that's the big plus of this platform. Even though it's all built on voxels and it's got this look like very like Atari, you know, or Nintendo. It's not like the best graphics, but but the fact that you can see it from your smartphone, it just makes it way more accessible to anyone. So uh, so so that's why we think Crypto voxels is very important, and also all of these token, all of this uh, artwork is our uh, NFTs. This, this one in particular is on on Bitcoin, the robot that you're seeing. But 
all the others are NFTs, ERC721 uh, ERC uh, tokens on, on Ethereum. Uh, so we launched this, uh, this art show uh, a few months ago and it was our first experience. Have, we, we've never, as far as I know, none of us have any previous experience on, on doing something like this. It was very easy, very straightforward. We had a lot of views. Uh, well, now I'm going to go to the central end, which has better graphs um, here. So this is the, the, the latest uh, show that we organized. Those are our avatars. In the central answer, everything is, is uh, very, um, how do you say, like uh, very standard. All the, all, the, all the avatars are pretty uh, similar. They, you don't have a, a, a lot of degrees of liberty in the central lines, uh, in the central land. But it's very interesting at the same time because I think it's very focused on on the economic side of the of the of the whole uh, virtual world. So you can sell your NFTs directly. You can put a fee uh, to get into your art show, and that's for the for the standpoint of the investors. That's very important for them. So that's why even though the central lands the central land is not as easy to use as crypto voxels. And the graphs are not as good as some other VR worlds that have nothing to do with blockchain. Still, is an appealing platform from the standpoint of the of the of the people with with the money from the from the investors. So this is our art show. It's called NFT Encounters of the Third World, and and me and some other uh, artists organized this, uh, and we launched it uh, a few weeks ago, and it's is very very. Uh, well, you can see it. we are all here hanging out <laughs> with our avatars. And then I'm going to jump to, to uh, VR chat. So VR chat had nothing to do with blockchain, but there are several worlds in there. Uh, and uh, you can see that the graphs are way better. And this, is, this, is, this one is an amazing world. It's called Alien Treehouse. So it's meant to be a house in the moon once Bitcoin goes to the moon, and we are going to be all living there. And you can see the <laughs> earth in the background. And, and you can see like the rooms in there that they have this like, like UFO shape. And you go inside those rooms and they have a bar, they have a showroom, they have an art gallery. So here's a, a small video of the, of the art show. And, and the graphs here are, are amazing. And the, and the, and the whole experience is, is very rich. If you have your headset with your with your joysticks, you, your your avatar like moves like like makes like like, like have a, a very a very complete expression body expression. And uh, yeah, that's it. This is VR chat um, that runs on on Steam, the gaming platform. And as you can see, the this is another world also in VR chat. It's also Bitcoin related. I, I just and you can make portals in all of these worlds to jump from one another. So let's say this world, I don't remember exactly the name of this, of this one. It, it said at the beginning. And, um, and you can make a portal to go into the other world. So it's very, it's very friendly and, and, and very beautiful. So let's wait until we get to the end of the tunnel. And uh, yep. And these are all built with Unity. So, um, so uh, these platforms are pretty open, different from the blockchain platforms. And yeah, that's, that's it. I just have more images. This is like a spaceship, also Bitcoin related in VR chat. And it's got a bar at the, at, at the end. Yeah. I didn't get the idea of portals. I mean, there is a way for you to move from one world to another, but I didn't see that. Happy yeah, I, I don't know if I have them on, on the photo. I don't think so. But the, the basic idea is once you are inside VR chat, you go into one of these worlds. And uh, instead of having to launch again into a different world from, from your home, let's say, 
uh, you can build a portal of the worlds uh, that you like the most of your friends, and you can just jump like a, like a time travel from one world to the next uh, once you build the portal. So that's very convenient to to just move around the different worlds inside VRChat. And wow, uh, yeah, that's, that's basically. So cool. there's a lot of art. There's a lot of uh, art shows in all of these uh, worlds. I'm trying to, yeah. Okay. Thank back, you. Uh, yes, yes, awesome. So uh, just make a small announcement. If you want to look to, uh, to go to one of these uh, uh, shows, we have one in the central land. In, uh, I'll, I'll share with you in the chat the, the coordinates to, to go into the parcel. Uh, that it's called NFT Encounters of the Third World. That's that one is in the Central Land. Then in VR Chat, I have two exhibitions uh, at the moment. One is called This Alien Treehouse, and the other one is called Bit Paint um, Bar, I believe. Bit Paint is is the guy that built it. You can find him in in, in Twitter. And in Crypto Voxels, uh, I don't know how for how long it's going to last, but our exhibition is called Nopal Recall. And, and that's that one is in crypto voxels. I will also share a link for anyone to to visit those art shows. Awesome, Jeez. thank you, uh, Gus. Uh, how often do you do those exhibitions? Uh, and like, it, uh, go. Ahead. Yeah, I, I I've been uh, I've been part of the of the of the uh, organizing team in two of them. One in crypto voxels and the light, and the latest one in the central land, and the other two ones in in VR chat. I was just invited as a as an artist, uh, but yeah, I, I I'm also a, a newbie on this. Like I I have tried the, the headset before, but never really got into the VR world until the pandemic. So to be respectful of time, we have one last topic to cover in the, in the next. 12 ish minutes. Um, so the last topic we're going to cover is digital photography and QR codes. Um, so I would like to kick off this conversation by asking red, um, kind of what was your motivation behind becoming involved with digital photography and QR codes? I know you kind of touched on this earlier. Um, and, uh, what made you stick with it? Um, okay, so as a kid, uh, I was uh, the friend who would carry a camcorder around. Um, uh, I was I was usually the guy who would uh, carry camcorders. We would make skits. I was the guy who would carry the the equipment. Um, so while I was in high school, um, I would go thrifting to make uh, extra income. And uh, usually, um, what I would go thrifting for were uh, college textbooks, clothes, and uh, oddities, really. And so how I would find uh, the value of these uh, books was mainly college books that I was selling, but how I would find the value was uh, I would get on this Amazon app and scan the barcode, right? And I really didn't, at this point, I wasn't even thinking of it as artwork yet. It, this was just work and f food to put in my stomach. Um, so the Amazon app would give me uh, how fast the how fast this item would sell or how valuable this item was before I went outside of this thrift store. Uh, before I had uh, used the money to purchase this item, I would look at it online. So um, my digital photography career began when uh, I was when I had graduated high school. Um, cause, uh, you know, when you're in high school, you try to figure out, do you go into the workforce or do you go to college? That kind of um, thing. So I flipped the coin to decide uh, whether or not to go to college. And I, I landed on, yeah, I, I go to college. So I go to college for digital photography and, um, uh, going meant, uh, going meant the possibilities of finding, uh, like-minded people and um it was basically just academics that i learned um i learned outside of school 
most most of what I learned today is outside of college. Um, the fact that I had to work for myself during college was a big deal for me. Um, so when Amazon's uh, seller app changed its uh, uh, scanning technique from scanning barcodes, scanning these textbook barcodes to just image recognition, that was almost like, a, a, I don't know what to call it, like a, like a breaking point, I would say, in, in what I thought a photo was. Um, so um, what, what other questions would you like to, that, that was really how I got to the connection with um, barcodes. Well, it was barcodes, but QR codes were like the second thing I started experimenting with that. It, they were related to each other, these QR codes and these barcodes. And uh, these QR codes, I would see them on, you know, lunch boxes. I would see, I would see them on a cereal. Uh, I mean, cereal boxes. I would see them everywhere, and I would just scan them with my phone. And it really looked like I was taking a photo of it, but what I was doing was getting information. So it was almost like a reverse photography. If you just, I don't know how to explain it, but. I'm not a techie, techie guy. I just, I'm just a guy who just goes out there and experiments with <laughs> interesting things. Um, no, that was that was a perfect explanation, Red. Thank you. Sorry, uh, Red. Can you send us like a, a link to images so we can see how you? Because oh, I, I, I like oh, yes. I like your approach, but I would like to see how it looks yeah, and compare. Let me screen share. Let me screen share with you guys. Thank you. Uh, hold on. This is my Discord, by the way. This is where I bring everyone. Um, so, can you guys see this the screen? Yep. Okay. So, this is basically my kind of like my first. Uh, I I was explaining to you how it was almost like an anti photo. This is like the first uh, thing, the first image that I made, and um, how I used to. Uh, ship these items that I would buy um, and and resell. Um, I would use uh, shipping labels. So this is a shipping label, and I would print uh, their their address and uh, what their names are in order to ship uh, these items. So I would almost use the the uh, the items that I would use for my normal work and use it for my artwork. Um, and this is my favorite book, Art of War. I uh, made a, a unique art piece for, for my favorite book. And this is kind of like my uh, laptop setup. These are my first three. This is, this is basically the laptop that I'm using to talk to you guys with. Um, let me scroll down here. So, um, yeah, if you guys have any questions, let me know. You could stop me at any time, really. Yeah, so what kind of images do these QR codes link to? Um, they don't necessarily, they don't have to necessarily link to images. That's the thing um, about how I'm linking this to digital photography is I, as a photographer, where do, where, where, uh, where do, tradi what, what does traditional, I mean, sorry. How does traditional photography move on from its, you know, DSLR, uh, um, almost like DSLR concept? Like it's you have to carry this big camera with you all the time. So, and um, there's always there's this threat in uh, digital photography where, um, in traditional digital photography where. Uh, the cell phone, like the smartphone, is your is your enemy, because um, people don't need to hire traditional digital photographers uh, as much anymore because of these smartphones. Um, you could use your smartphone in a wedding. You could use it. You don't. You know. You know where I'm getting. So it was like. So how do you move on from that as a digital photographer? So scanning these items and. Uh, Scanning these items uh, in, in thrift stores really helped me put 
one and one together, um, one and two together. Um, yeah, and uh, I would draw, I, and the, this is a funny thing, um, printing became an essential. So it was almost like bringing printing back from bringing printing to the to to my photos again, because um, we have this era where it's digital and it's just stored in your uh, it's stored in your phone and it's never printed. So my work is physical in a sense where it's it's both physical and digital, if you know what I mean. And um, yeah. Um, so how my work relates to blockchain, um, it's, it's photos with utility and uh, QR codes are uh, open source, really. Anyone could use it and they're very accessible. Um, I don't know if you guys know this, but it also developed in Japan. Um, uh, the concept developed in 1994. And which is also the same year, um, smart the Nick Zabo, if you know who Nick Zabo is, uh, the sm smart contract concept was uh, kind of brought to life during that 1994 time frame. So this is uh, you. I don't know who was talking about shipping, uh, like shipping um, uh, blockchain items, or, and, and shipping it to shipping the physical uh, form to people. And um, there was a time that, where was, where was this dated? This is dated May 5th, actually, uh, 2019. So I have this um, this shipping box and I stared at it for like the longest time. And I was wondering if I could kind of one day uh, have this project where I ship my artwork, my ship my physical artwork to uh people and at the same time still have it be attached to um, blockchain. So is, should, does anyone have any questions? I don't know if um, I'm speaking too much. Uh, I have a two things to say. Once again, I'm not from the art space. Yeah. I do think the QR code is interesting in that you can make art from the QR code, and then at the same time, the QR code could have within it, if you scan it, a link to other art that is on the blockchain or IPFS. It could be like a one-two punch sort of thing. That was the first thing that came to my mind. Just mm -hmm. like, and it's, it's, it's also it's it's also in a in a sense where I'm messing with pixels also, and digital photography has a lot to do with pixels. Okay. So, oh, yeah, yeah. It was kind of like playing with pixels and seeing how I could make these pixels useful. And in my head uh, at the time, uh, QR codes were the only useful pixels that everybody uses. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of how um, uh, smartphones are smart, like smartphones uh, are almost they can't escape QR codes. But on the other spectrum of traditional photography, you have this threat where, you know, smartphones are your uh, uh, enemy, where on in, in, in this version of what I call uh, digital photography, um, smartphones are my friends. Um, right. My work really doesn't work without a smartphone. So it's almost as if, uh, I don't know, it's almost as if... Uh, uh, I had, I don't want to say betrayed my uh, traditional um, photography uh, academic, I don't know what to call it, but it was kind of like breaking that traditional uh, thinking and figuring out how to reassemble it back into a utility again. So here are a bunch of monkeys. I call them code monkeys. Ah. Uh. <laughs> uh, the, the other point I wanted to make, and it's not even a point, it's actually a question. Um, 
the I see just the server there for it, rareable, and it, actually this is one of the, the reasons. Oh, I you even, see the side too? Yeah, excuse me. The side is a bit messy. I have a no, lot. No, it's fine. <laughs> I just didn't know what anyone's thought. It's rareables, one of those platforms you guys were speaking of before, or is that something different? I went and checked um, it out. Rareables. The the upside of rareable is they don't have a waiting list it's a it's a platform that you could just get on and you know attach your your work to a blockchain almost yeah so okay. it's 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 i in my opinion user friendly like if somebody wants to get to know blockchain and this is the easiest way in my opinion um to to go is rare oh, okay i've just been seeing it and i've been to the site even yeah, before they, this, so it was they, it just they, seemed interesting. Yeah, they just made their own uh, Discord too. They made it like three weeks ago, so you're not you're not too far behind. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so this is me basically experimenting with um, these QR codes and seeing what I could do with them, how I could how I could form faces with them. Um, and this is again on a um, thermal printed sticker. This is the same sticker I would use to ship all my items that I would use to, that, that I would sell on uh, Amazon or eBay. And um, let me scroll all the way down to where I changed my uh, concept code. So here is a concept um, I came back to. Um, how I was talking about posting my artwork and at the same time, like uh, attaching it to the blockchain. This was kind of like a uh, experiment of using um, fluorescent paint and uh, painting on a, a priority mail or USPS shipping like shipping boxes. And this I is like what this. Like that, this. That's a good idea. And this is black light too. And we we were just talking about the coronavirus. You you know, um, black light kills um, corona. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I was going with uh, this was a bot that I made like a almost like a prototype to see how I could uh, get uh, off the digital realm because I want to rem I always have to remember I have to it's 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 my job well I'm making it a job to educate people in the physical world so I have to somehow make my work physical so people could relate to it people could touch it and most of all um, uh, non tech savvy people could still digest physical work so that was, this is kind of like my hedge against the digital, the strictly digital, uh, uh, I don't, uh, strictly digital uh, aura that this uh, niche has. So this was, yeah, this is basically me branching out to, my, actually my work has always been physical, uh, but I have to attach it digitally in a, I have to mix it digitally. Okay, so this right. was the mother box. I gave this to my mother on Mother's Day. So guys, I, I would like to double check if every one of you have sent the boats. Ah, someone did a distribution. Yay. Sorry. So now this is a new feature. On top, you can see how the results were. On below, you can see like we can continue the talk. Oh. The prices are so freaking high. So thank you. Guys. <laughs> yeah. Are you talking about the gas prices? Yes. Yeah, yeah gas prices yeah. are ridiculous right yeah. now. <laughs> I was about to say too. <laughs> but uh, yeah, anyway. So, um, so yeah, how my work I already explained how my work kind of um, relates to blockchain or kind of um, has a utility, a useful purpose in blockchain where 
um, you could send addresses, you could send Bitcoin addresses to people via VR code, or you could send uh, identity, or you could send, I don't know, you could send a lot of things uh, via QR code. Um, and it's almost seeing uh, a minimalistic version of what photos really are. And they are essentially pixels, colorful pixels. Yeah, if anybody wants me to drop a link uh, to the Discord again, I, I will. Um, so th this is just my uh, personal uh, uh, channel where I dump all my um, all my uh, work. The art blogging side is kind of it's it's like a way for people to get introduced to blockchain which is another part. And I use Instagram. Instagram is a very essential part of uh, where I find most artists at. Um, Twitter was kind of weird. Twitter, it took me a while to get used to Twitter because um, of just how, the how they set up images over there on Twitter. It's not as, um, it's not as, uh, let's say the, 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 the portraits or the the angles on Twitter don't fit um, as much as they don't fit as much as on uh, Instagram. So I feel like Instagram is the it's it's the uh, it's the best way it's the best place to post photos. So that's where I usually go. So this is this is a interesting one right here. Um, this was a canvas that I uh, that I made. And I sold to someone um, who um, who wants to put uh, artwork in their office, and um, the QR code the, the QR code here links to the person's um, work website. So it's almost like uh, my work had like a, a a practical utility at the same time. Yeah, that's awesome. That's very cool. And um, dealing with light, um, I decided to uh, have it look differently in different lighting, light settings. Like here you have the uh, daylight and here you have black light. Um, and here is uh, no light. Um, it says uh, code is law. And that's what I kind of use on my uh, artwork most of the time, just to make people emphasize on my QR codes. Um, and here's what it looks like on the back. I tried using hashtags, hashtags, and uh, here's the royalties. This is uh, basically QR code to uh, Cash App and Venmo. So it was kind of like having people experiment with cashless payments as opposed to just giving me cash and uh, yeah. Reth, thank you so much. I would like to respect people's time. I mean, we have been here for more than two hours, so we're yeah, grateful I'm, I'm to done. have you guys. Uh, I don't know else what to say. I'm super excited about how this talk went, all the topics that we cover. If you guys want to continue hanging out here, I mean, this call, I think, Thing is not going to end. I mean, at least everyone lives. So it's like part of the meetup, but it's the hard part too. If people are going to connect, feel free to share your contacts in the chat. Um, we're really excited to keep building this Coinosis thing. We think that knowledge flows in different directions. We have for sure speakers that, I mean, we just know them and they have some expertise, but we love people to have to join people that they can add knowledge with questions on their thoughts. So that's the, our our why, our ethos, that knowledge goes everywhere, I mean, in different directions. And a proxy for that is crypto. So we're using these smart contracts to do that. Also, I want to thank Cody for helping us to bring people from Pittsburgh. And for sure, Goose, Jessica, Red, and Johnny for joining us and all this familiar faces 
Mr. Mo Moharra from different uh, sessions that we already have, and people in Peru, Adolfo. Uh, we also have people in Panama with Erol. So they already. They, I mean, please share your 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 contacts on, in the chat. So I will leave that from my side, Cody. I don't know if you want to add anything else. Yeah, I just want to say thank you to everybody who came out, the guests that came to speak. I learned so much from all of you, and you all had valuable input and really awesome work to share. And I'd love to stay in contact with, you know, all of you. Um, so thank you. And thank you for uh, for the organizers. This is a great uh, initiative. I think uh, I would love to 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 be part of more events like this in in a, in a global scale, which is very valuable. I'm very very happy for for being here. So and hopefully I'll visit Pittsburgh sometime soon. I would love to host you, man. You're <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Cody. <laughs>